stone kami? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so if we're stranded, we'll stay here together. And, uh, that's fine. No, no, no. We praise God for the opportunity to be here, and uh, it's a great, it's a great opportunity to be with the family of God to hear God's word. Okay. So um, yeah. Before I before I start the message, I just wanted to ask. Okay. One of the things that was really kind of a culture change here in uh, New Zealand when I when I moved here is the way they do their haircut. Okay, because in the Philippines I would go to a hair salon and I noticed that there's a big difference. Here you sit down and they put what that an apron, then they cut your hair, brush it off a little, then you go home, right? And then you pay and you go home. Because I, 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 I experienced when I was in the Philippines, every time I go to a hair salon, there are three people that will take care of you. First is, once they give you the, what do you call that, apron? Bib? Okay, I lost it. Okay, a big bib. Okay, big bib. Okay, so uh, once you have that apron, the first person will uh, ask you to go and lie down and put your hair on a sink, right? So that you will be rinsed, right? And then they will shampoo you. Now, after the shampoo and the rinse, you go back to your seat, you wait for a while, then the second person comes, and the second person actually does your haircut, <coughs> right? And then, after the haircut, okay, the first person asks you to come with uh, her, usually, you know, and go again and rinse your hair and then you go back to your seat after the rinse and then after the rinse okay there's a third person that comes in that blow dries your hair and puts some gel right then after that the second person who cut your hair comes back and do, does a little bit more trim then you're done Am I, is it just me or is that is that what usually happens so I was kind of shocked that uh, when I, the first time I had my hair cut here, there was none of that. It was just a sit down, get your apron, cut, 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 ee, ee. and they even ask you what number? Number? Like house number? Okay, do you know that? You have a number on how thin the cut is, and then yeah, that's it. But basically, what I was saying is, when I had the, when I would have a haircut in the Philippines. You know, I'm not complaining, okay? At least I have hair. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, but anyway, it was really over and beyond what is expected. So I would think uh, people here who would go to the Philippines and have a normal haircut in a hair salon will be surprised with all the things that would happen in a haircut. It's way beyond what was expected, right? Uh, for a... <laughs> If you compute it, even for just a $5 haircut in the Philippines, you get all of that. Now, the topic today is something related to that. I will try to link it. But the idea is, it's something over and beyond what is expected. And it's, in, it's kind of a tough message. I had to pray a lot because, you know, there's so many things in my head that I couldn't uh, organize it this week. So I really prayed a lot. So later on, as we start this message, I'm going to pray and please, let's all pray together so that it will be God's message that is spoken and I'm simply God's messenger. The idea is the word reproach. When you say the word reproach, it means you find fault, disgrace, or discredit. Or it's a, you know, you have, a, they, people would have a reason to criticize you because they see something in you that is questionable. That is reproach. When you say you're living above reproach, you are trying to say that the way you live your life is such a high standard that no fault can be found in you. So it's not simply just the level, oh, at least I'm not sinning, at least I'm not sinning, but you go way and beyond that so that you're not simply at the edge of not sinning, but you're so careful with your life that when people look at you, there will not be a hint or a question that you are living the Christ-like life um, every day. So basically, the idea of living above reproach is that you have a good testimony to the people around you. And I pray that you will understand how powerful your testimony is. 
some people would refuse to read the Bible. But when they look at your lives, they will start to soften their hearts when they see that you have a Christ that is truly alive and it is changing you. You have a powerful testimony to share. The question is, is that testimony going to encourage a person to want to know Christ or when they, when they look at your life, will the opposite happen? They will be turned off to want to know about Jesus because of how they, they see you. So my prayer is we will have such a good testimony because we are living above reproach. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Live such good lives among the pagans so that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. It's saying here, you live among the pagans. Pagans means they don't believe in God. They don't follow Jesus. God is not telling us that we separate ourselves from the world. We will be forever, in, we will be in the world for the rest of our lives. And the question is, will you be able to influence the people around you in a positive way? Will you make a difference? So live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. That means they might accuse you. They might question your faith. They might even laugh at you. But because they see a consistent Christ-like life in your lives, later on, all those accusations will be turned around and become praises to God in the future. Wow! It means your testimony can actually make a big difference. And it doesn't matter what age you are or what background you are, if you truly have Christ in your life and it is changing you and people see that, that is powerful. Now if I ask you, who among you here, you are below 20 years old. Raise your hand. No, not you. Raise your hand. Raise your hand below 20. Okay? Between 21 to 30. Raise your hand. Okay? We're not above reproach. Okay. 31 to 40. 41 to 300. <laughs> 41 above? Oh, doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. Okay? Yes, yes. Okay? It doesn't matter what age you, you are in, you can make a big difference. You know, teenagers, sometimes you think, oh, I'm, I'm, young, I'm too young to make a difference. I don't think so. Not in the experience of uh, myself or the people around me. Now, what is... Above rep what that's what above reproach is. But what is it not? It doesn't mean that you will live a completely sinless life. Okay? It is it doesn't mean that you will forever be clear you forever be clean, you will never sin. That is almost impossible. As long as we have this flesh, we will we will be, we will sin. But the idea is how do you respond to failure and when you sin? Do you respond the proper way wherein you confess immediately and you also ask for forgiveness from the people that you have hurt? Okay? That will be a big test whether you are living above reproach. If you live above reproach, people will see that you have a strong Christ-like character and you don't, don't simply wilt under human pressure and it will attract people to ask the question why why are you living above reproach they might not ask you directly but they will ask in their heads why is this guy way above the norm and is living above reproach and you cannot question him and that will be the power of your testimony because later on you can probably you know share the gospel to them but this is not easy. It is not comfortable. Because sometimes we can say, well, this is my life. I'm old enough to make this, the decisions I want to make. I can do whatever I want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Okay? Or sometimes we might think, well, I'm, I'm good. I haven't killed anyone. The only thing I killed this week was a cockroach. You know? But that's even non-Christians are good. Correct? So what is it 
wherein you live above reproach, that they will see this is extraordinary goodness and an extraordinary kind of standard of living that will attract people to want to know why. And you can answer in different ways and say, it is because I follow Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, live above or live beyond reproach. If we live above reproach, we will make a bigger difference for Christ. This is our theme for the year. So let's pray and let's talk about, once again, you know, let's talk about the process. How late, how you can develop an, an above reproach lifestyle. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. This is not easy, especially when the standards of this world are so low. And when you are trying to go above the standards of this world, people would laugh and criticize us. So we pray, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts so that we can know the right process, step by step, how to live above reproach. A lifestyle that will be so attractive to people around us that they would want to know why we live this way. And later on, in some ways, we can answer and say, it's because I follow Christ. I'm here to please God, not men. Oh Lord, Father God, this is your message for all of us. This is your message for me. Speak to each and every one of us right now. Let your spirit move mightily in our hearts and our minds. I declare I'm simply your messenger. And let this be your message for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Okay. So if you have your Bibles, I always want you to um, open your Bibles. But if not, you can look at the screen. But don't depend on the screen. Okay? So, let me first explain to you this uh, next slide. Okay? So, yeah. There. Okay? In life, you know, they have colors when they say it's either black or white. Okay? They, there are some things in the Bible, it's very clear it's wrong. And it's very clear it's right. So sometimes you say it's black and white. When you say it's black and white, it means it's clear. It's obvious that it's a sin. It's obvious that it is good. Okay? So when, when you have your convictions, you must be strong and believe that what the Bible says is exactly what you should follow. It's black, it's, it's black and white, okay? Black and white areas. It's clearly stated in the Bible, so you obey 100%. So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. So if you have your Bibles, you, you underline this, you highlight this, do whatever you want, but this is important. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you live this way, it's easy to question. And people will question you. Are you really a Christian? Okay? If you're doing this. Now, obviously, you know, if you're doing witchcraft, you know, people will question you, are you, really, are you really a Christian? Are you really a Christ follower? Because you're doing witchcraft. Okay? But that's the obvious one. Well, let's look at a few of these in the, in the, in the verse. Okay? How about impurity? Okay? Is there any kind of impurity or impure thoughts in your life? Factions. What are factions? Divisions. Okay? You want to join this side of the issue, that side of the issue, or you cause divisions. Okay? Are you that kind of person? How about fits of rage? Okay? Do you easily get angry? Okay? That's obvious. If you easily get angry, people will question you, are you really a Christ follower? Why are you easily angry? And it destroys your testimony. And the worst thing is when you're angry, you say words that you don't really mean and it's hard to take back once you say it already. Okay? How about selfish ambition? And people see your life, you, they can see that, you know, yeah, you're driven, but it's really just for your benefit so that you can gain more out of life. It's more about what's in it for me in this life. Okay? When people see that, you see, wow. Isn't a Christ follower a person for other people and things like that? So they will question that. How about envy? When they see that you are always discontented, 
okay? And you envy people, you're jealous of people, and you compare yourself to people. When we live that kind of life lifestyle, you won't be above reproach. How about drunkenness? Okay, or orgies. Orgies meaning wild parties, and sometimes it's related to sex as well. Okay, so these are obvious. So the idea here is your convictions must be strong. That this is absolutely no compromise. When I think that this that I will be tempted to do these kinds of sins, I already back off. And I will not start it. Okay? Now here's the thing about this. It never it never becomes simply immediately witchcraft. It's never usually immediately fits of rage. It's never usually immediately drunkenness. But somewhere along the line, there were little compromises and you got away with it so that you did bigger compromises, you got away with it, and later on the compromise is so big and your heart is now callous and you think there are some situations it's okay to sin. It starts from a little. That is why even when it's a little, you already cut it off. Don't try to justify in your head, oh, having fits of rage once a month is okay. I know of people, if I compare myself to them, they, they do fits of rage once a week. So that's, not, that's like relative morality. Okay? You're comparing yourself to others instead of what the Bible says. So you, do, you cut it immediately um, when it's small. Let's look at, look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. Again, and this can be a memory verse for some of you. Okay? It says, But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, rather thanksgiving. What did I underline? Not be even a hint. Okay? There is nothing in your life that suggests, okay, that you have impurity. Okay? For example, you know, I, I, I think I did this example before. If I can check the history, you know, the, the history of your websites, the websites that you look at, will there be any hint? On those web in, in those history that you are compromising your faith that you are just looking at questionable sites okay now I remember when I was still working okay, I have this desk and what I do is in the morning when I arrive in the office I get my Bible then I have my quiet time in the office first so I leave my Bible open no now, once I'm done, I go back to work, but sometimes I don't close the Bible, okay? So that if I have like many, many breaks during the day, I would look at some of the verses in the Bible and <coughs> meditate on that. So that's what I would usually do. Now, one time, there's this office mate of mine. He came towards me, and was, he was already sharing some dirty jokes, okay? And, you know, I don't know, it's, I don't know why they call it green jokes, but basically dirty jokes, you know, lustful kind of jokes. So he comes to me and he's sharing these jokes. And while he was sharing these jokes, he saw my Bible. Okay? And he said, oh, oh sorry, sorry. Um, uh, I shouldn't, I, I, I think you're having your quiet time. And that's what he said. I think you're having your quiet time. Uh, sorry, sorry. That was surprised because uh, how did he understand the term quiet time? And then he said, I'm actually a Christian. <laughs> I'm actually a Christian. So, uh, but anyway, and he said something like, oh, okay, I, I won't say the, the punchline of the joke anymore. Okay? But the idea is, okay, I was surprised when he said he was a Christian. Okay? But I did not, I did not kind of judge him saying, no, not really. Money. Okay? I didn't do that. But of course, that's not living above reproach, right? Because, you know, uh, he only stopped when he saw me, the, the, I saw that the Bible was open. So that's not living above reproach. That's being very questionable. Okay? Now, we have to be very careful with our testimony. I remember in another job setting, in another company, 
I was in the graphics design room, okay? Because I was um, finalizing some of the marketing materials that we were about to print with the designer. And then another marketing manager barges into the room and says, you know, hey, where, where is the designs that I've asked you to do? You know, and you know, he said a lot of things that was kind of trying to in, impute to, my, to the designer that he was being incompetent. So I felt bad because I knew this guy was a Christ follower, a strong Christ follower even at that. So I was kind of embarrassed, I was just quiet, but I heard him saying a lot of nasty things to the, to the designer. And so he leaves the room, and then uh, I continue to talk to the designer, and then he started going to his computer to continue his design. And then he started whispering to me, Ryan, isn't that guy a Christian? Okay. Isn't that guy attending Bible studies? And then, you know, I was kind of embarrassed. I didn't want to say, well, actually, he's from CC. <laughs> okay. I should have, he's from another church. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. But, you know, um, it was kind of, it wasn't, the guy wasn't living above reproach. So I was embarrassed to, to even talk to the designer. So this guy who never attended our church, just, I guess, heard somewhere that my friend, my office mate was a Christian, and yet he was not living above reproach during that time. Okay? Those are some examples of testimonies of not living above reproach, and their testimonies are questionable. Whether you like it or not, people are watching you. Even if you say, oh, no one knows that I'm a Christian, you know what, later on, if you're truly a Christian, they will know. And they will also know if you're living a double standard lifestyle. The good news about the second story I shared is that that person later on actually went to the designer and really apologized. And he said that I was just so pressured during that time and I really apologize for, for how I treated you. So in a way, it, it, um, it ended pretty well. If I ask you, is there any hint in your life that can discredit you from being known as a true Christ follower? If I ask you, simple, how's your work ethic? Do you have good relationships with your boss? Is there any negligence in your life, in your work life? Is there any laziness, insubordination? Is there any lack of excellence in your work? Is there any hint that will question that you are a Christ follower in your workplace? You know what? The mindset is you are first a Christ follower, okay? Not a worker. You are first. Your identity is not with your work. Your identity is you are a Christ follower. So you can say, I am, I am a Christian who happens to be in the workplace. You do not say, I am in the workplace who happens to be a Christian. Your foremost identity is you are a Christ follower wherever you go. And that people see that you are above reproach. If I ask you, are you ab above reproach in terms of saving and spending your money? Or do you simply say, well, it's my money, I earned this, and this is how I want to spend it, okay? Or, okay, will, or will people question you when they look at your bank accounts, okay? Will they see, oh, this person is um, taking care of his or her finances. When they look at the spending, I can see that this person follows Christ. Will be. You can tell a lot with a bank statement of a person, how a person spends his money, okay? What words usually come out of your mouth? Is there any hint that Jesus Christ is your top priority? Or is he just in the back seat? Strong convictions are developed when we don't compromise even in the little issues. So it's my prayer. It says here, there must not be even a hint. Many years ago, I had a problem with um, pornography, okay? And then decided, no more pornography. But for a couple of years after that commitment of no more pornography, I still had pornographic materials 
in my cabinet. But I said, well, I don't look at it anymore, right? But when I, look, when I saw this verse, let there not be even a hint. I realized if someone would have gone into my house, you know, and checked my, my room, will there be a hint of immorality or impurity? So I decided to burn it. But for some reason, it was so windy, it wouldn't burn. <laughs> so, I kept it. No. <laughs> I threw it away. Okay? So, I'm just saying, let there not even be a hint. Okay? Be careful with, just as an additional, be careful with the words you use. Because sometimes the words, you know, will, sh will kind of show what's really in your heart. We talked about this two weeks ago when I talked about speak forth in love. The issue is not with the mouth. If it's dirt, if you have a dirty mouth, it only reveals what's in your heart. So make sure if you want to have a clean mouth, you have to clean your heart. Okay? So your convictions must be strong. Secondly, okay, your conscience must be sensitive. Now, a while ago I was talking about black and white areas. Very obvious, very clear this is wrong, very clear this is right. Now, there are what they call gray areas, somewhere in the middle. You're not really sure. There are times it can be wrong, there are times it can be right. Okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 to 24, it says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So there are things that sometimes it's okay to do, sometimes it's not okay. But the idea behind it is, every action that you do, is, it, is that it's because you love that person, or it's out of love. You're thinking of the good of the other person. So you have to have a sensitive conscience, you know, like a moral awareness, whether what you're gonna do might be wrong or might be right, especially in that situation. Like in James chapter 4, verse 17, it says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Okay? So basically, if you know what to do, but you don't do it, is that a sin? Based on this verse, yes. So for some, that is a sin, but for some, it is not a sin. Okay, so let your conscience be uh, be very sensitive, so that you have an awareness what God is telling you to do. You ha you need discernment. Okay, so to live above reproach, you need to come up with guidelines, and you're not simply walking at the edge. Oh, I'm not sinning. I'm not sinning. All right. But the idea of above reproach is you're making sure you're out of the edge, and you also put some barriers to make sure that you do not fall. You are being proactive and being careful. For example, I have a friend, okay? He loves basketball. He loves watching the NBA. However, his biggest problem during that time was lustful thoughts. So he, he came to me and he said, I have a dilemma. I love basketball, but I have lustful thoughts. I said, okay, I kind of understand your dilemma. What do you mean? Okay. So basically, he shared that every time he watches NBA games, like the whole game, there are some instances that there are, that he would see cheerleaders in skimpy outfits and dancing, sometimes in between, you know, the time, during the timeouts and during the halftime show. And for him, it causes lustful thoughts. Okay. So, we talked about it, and he said, okay, I'm going to make a boundary. Yeah, I like NBA, but because I, I love God more than entertainment, I will stop watching NBA. You know, that's just an example of setting up boundaries, and God has led him to do that. Okay? So, the idea here, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Very important verse. So many ways you can apply this in your life. All right? Verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes from the, 
not from the Father, but from the world. And the reminder in verse 17, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You can apply that in so many ways. But the idea here is, there will always be a competition for your heart. Whether your heart will be totally given to God, or your heart is elsewhere. It says here, in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or no, in some verses, the most full pride of life. Sometimes, we desire money more than obeying God. Sometimes, we, we have an ambition that you will do anything at any cost to reach that ambition, even compromising your faith. Okay? So my prayer is loving God. You know, you will love God so much that your conscience is so sensitive and you can hear God very clearly and you can be very discerning when you make decisions. You will say, I love God, therefore I will be careful not to do anything that will hurt my God. I'm willing to set up boundaries in my life. So, for example, okay, what if I told you, okay, especially those of you who are parents, what if I told you that your family is under attack? Okay? That there is someone who is trying to hurt your family physically. What will you do? Okay? I would think you will call the police, perhaps. You will be more careful. You will have a, a few more padlocks in the house. You will lock the doors more. And you will be more vigilant around you to make sure that you are careful and aware so that when that person attacks, you are ready. Okay? Physical attacks. But, but what if I told you that your family is under attack right now? Not physically, perhaps, but spiritually. Spiritually, there is an attack of the devil to destroy your families. And you can give the devil some credit. He is relentless. He will to try to destroy families. And he is attacking your family. So the question is, what will you do if you are fully aware that Satan is out to destroy and break your family? What were you going to do? What are some initiatives that you will do to make sure that you are protected against the evil one? I would think you would pray even more. I would think you will ask people to pray for your family. I would think that you will do things to make sure that there is no division in the family. Okay? You will set up boundaries. Okay? For example, a boundary can be, okay, you will, if you are married, you will not dine out or you will not eat out with someone of the opposite sex. Okay? And you, say, you can say, oh, but nothing's going to develop there. Well, you set up your boundaries to make sure. Okay? For those who are single, if someone invites you and it's a married man, okay, what will you say? It depends. What restaurant? <laughs> Come on! Okay? You set up boundaries, they cannot. Okay? Or, if someone does that, you know, you say, can, in, can, can I invite my whole family and all my relatives? In, in, okay? I don't know. But you set up some boundaries. You want to make sure you want, you are above reproach and there is no question. Okay? For the singles, don't be alone in the room with the opposite sex if you want to be above reproach. Because some people might question, why are, you know, yeah, maybe they're not doing anything wrong in that room, but it can be questioned. Okay? Maybe there's no sin, but what we're trying to teach you here is living above reproach. For the teenagers, the favorite question when it comes to relationships with the opposite sex for teenagers is, how far is too far? Okay? How far is too far? Okay, yeah, we know it's too far already when you, you, you've committed sexual immorality. Okay? But is that already the determinant of what is far? How about French kissing? Is that okay? You know what? I'm not here. There's no Bible verse that says, Thou shalt not French kiss. Aha! So, you good? Okay? <laughs> of course not. The idea and the principle behind it is that you will have boundaries so that whatever that might cause you lust, you don't do it. Okay? 
So, if holding hands will cause you to last or cause that person to last, then you don't hold hands. Okay? I know of a pastor. Okay? They were, he was engaged to, another woman, to, to a woman and they did not kiss until their wedding day. Okay? For me and my wife, the first time my wife kissed me on the lips was on our wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If things, if touching the hair of the opposite sex will cause you to last, then don't even touch it. Do you understand? The principle behind this, you set up boundaries. Make sure your conscience is sensitive to the Holy Spirit. First Timothy chapter three, verse two to three says. Now an overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Now the context here is leaders in the church, overseers. And you, these are, uh, many times it's, it's the men. But you know what? In a way, we are all leaders because we influence people. Okay? We should have these kinds of characteristics in our own life. And if you look here, look, look here, what are the qualifications to be a leader? Almost all of it, almost all of it is about the character. The only skill that is written here to be a leader is able to teach. And you can even do that because we can give you the materials and you teach it. But to be a leader, it's mostly about character. Okay? And the first characteristic of a leader or a requirement of a leader is above reproach. People cannot question your life. Third, okay? your convictions must be strong, your conscience must be sensitive, and thirdly, your conduct must not be a stumbling block. Okay? Your conduct must not be a stumbling block. So a while ago, we were talking about black and white areas. It's very obvious what is right, what is wrong. There's also gray areas, which is sometimes it might be right, sometimes it might be wrong. It's not conclusively clear um, if it's right or wrong. And sometimes it's circumstantial. But there are also some situations where we would say it's white. It's all right. It's absolutely okay. Right? But you withhold your rights or you withhold doing it because it might cause someone to stumble in their faith. You decide, I, won't ju I just won't do it because it might cause someone to get hurt. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 and 12 to 13, it says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. When you sin against them in this way, and wound their weak conscience, you, you sin against Christ. So if you cause someone to stumble, you're sinning against Christ. So verse 13, the context here, Therefore, if, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. So the idea, the context here is, some of the Christians were eating meat that were previously uh, offered to the idols. And for the Christians, some Christians, you know, they say, well, you know what? Because usually the meat is good, okay? They're choice meat. So for some Christians, they say, hey, no problem, okay? I mean, what are idols? They're worthless, okay? There's only one real God. So sometimes they get the meat and they eat it. But for some Christians, they have... Uh, you know, they have, they, they don't like that. They feel offended. So, what the Apostle Paul is saying here is, just so that no one will stumble, especially my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, then I'd rather not eat the meat. You withhold your rights. Okay? Now, for us, I don't, for many of you, I don't see a problem with eating. You eat anything. Correct? Now, I just want to just a little break. Tell your seatmate, what is the weirdest thing that you have ever eaten? 
What is the weirdest thing that you've ever eaten? Okay. Sometimes when we talk about what the weirdest thing you eat is about baluk, right? Or what's that in English? Embryo. Okay. What else? What's the weirdest thing you, you, you eat? Crocodile. Who sure eats a crocodile who eats us? Alright. Bird? Bat? Wow. Okay. Was it good, boy? Yeah? Was like turkey. Okay. So anyway, the idea there is, so I don't really think uh, we have that, we have that issue when it comes to eating. But perhaps since especially many of you are are immigrants, we probably might might be good to understand also the the culture here, so we can be more sensitive and careful with what might be offending to their culture. Now, for one, one thing I learned in this culture, especially for the Islanders and for the Maoris. Um, it's kind of improper when you stand or sit on tables, okay? Or any table or any place wherein food is served or food is prepared, okay? And I think the mindset there is, you know, we want to make sure we have clean food. So when you sit on the, you know, when you sit on tables where there is food or you stand on them and your shoes are dirty, it can, you know, infect. But you know, so ever since I heard about this about two years ago, I was being more careful. Okay, so that's just a little example of trying to understand the culture so that we are not stumbling block to others. Okay, now a few other things when it comes to not being a stumbling block. Second, oh sorry, in Philippians chapter two verse fourteen, do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless above reproach and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Now the main context here is doing ministry without complaining. You just keep on serving. Now the problem is if you see, you know, <coughs> church members, example, doing a lot of complaining, arguing, and divisiveness, and people outside of the church hears about this, you know, it's a turn off. I mean, why would I want to join a church that has a lot of arguing and a lot of division? So we have to make sure that we are careful that we don't cause uh, people to stumble with our attitudes or with our complaining. Okay? They'll be turned off. Instead, if we are careful, we don't grumble, we don't argue, we don't fight, what happens? You will shine among them. Okay? You will shine, meaning you will stand out and they will be attracted to your, your life and to the Christ that you follow. Okay? Now another is how about clothing? The clothes that you wear. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or ex expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. The idea here of clothing is that make sure it doesn't cause people to stumble or, or have a wrong impression of who are you representing. Don't let your clothing make people stumble. Okay, for example, for the women, sometimes, but it's just a style, okay, there's nothing wrong with it. But sometimes when, for example, your skirt is too short or, you know, or I'm not really sure, or maybe the blouse is too low, okay, it can cause people to lust and you don't even know it because you're a woman and a man has a different brain, okay, totally different brain. So they think of wrong thoughts already sometimes, okay. Now, I don't know for the men, okay? This, the same concept here is you don't cause people to stumble. 
or like uh, in a church setting, you know, we want people to, we want to point to God. But with your clothing, okay, they look at you instead of looking at God. Okay, so you don't, you know, that's the, that's the uh, principle here. Now for the guys, I'm not really sure. But uh, I don't know, I don't see anyone here really wearing a lot of bling blings. Anyone, you know, bling blings? All these kind of jewelry and, you know, uh, whatever for the guys. But the idea there is, if, uh, if, you, if you do those things and you wear these things, they might kind of think, is that really just fashion? Or is this because you love money and you want to show off your, you know, your gold jewelry? So just be careful. It's not sinful okay, to wear those kinds of clothes, but it might cause people to stumble. Okay? With our conversations, make sure you are also not a stumbling block. In Romans 14.13, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. So we have to be careful also, especially when you have conversation with someone and you're talking about another person. Sometimes when you talk to, you talk to someone, you're talking about another person, be careful because you might be sharing some sensitive information about that person you know, and later on will cause that person to stumble if they found out that you shared some sensitive information uh, to them. Okay? Now, it can be also any kind of topic, but what comes out of your mouth, okay, does it show that Jesus is really the priority of your life? Or is he just in the back seat? Let them know through your conversations that your first love <coughs> is God. Be careful with our jokes. And make sure that sometimes, you know, you just withhold your rights so that you don't cause anyone to stumble. Okay? Now, here's, I'm about to close. But the idea here is, being above reproach is not about pleasing people. Okay? It's about pleasing God. Because sometimes you might be too careful. Oh, I won't, I won't do this because that person might stumble. You know, and you'll be so careful that you say to yourself, I'll just stay at home. Because if I go out of the house, you know, someone might stumble. That's not the idea. But your mindset is, you love and you want to please God. So you're just more careful with the way you think, with the words that you say, and the actions that you do. Okay? So it's about God. It's about pleasing God, not about others. The way you give up your rights is about pleasing God. Okay? So as I close, the best example... I would think of is Jesus. In Mark chapter 3, verse 2, okay, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if, would, if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Okay? So people were looking around and looking for something to accuse Jesus of. But in John chapter 18, verse 38, as you know, when he was facing Pilate, this is what Pilate said. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. So they were closely monitoring Jesus, and yet they could not find any charge. How about you? When people look at your life, will they find any charge? Okay? Now, it's kind of a weird illustration, but what if someone entered your house, once a month, there is one weekend, there will be someone in your house, and all that person is doing is to observe how you relate to your family. What will be the report? Will they say, above reproach? And then the following weekend, that person, that person starts going to your office. And for one week, that person will be following you all around, watching you, okay? And will make sort of like a check, a checklist. Will you be above reproach in your workplace? Okay? And maybe for some of you, when you are in the grocery or when you are driving, that same person is checking, are you above reproach? Or are you always over speeding a little bit I don't know okay 
or is there any compromise in your life? Okay? So, it's not a simple topic, but if we truly understand living above reproach, people will think you're weird, people will think you're different, and later on, they will ask why, and it will be your opportunity to make a difference in their lives. I can just imagine what it would be if everyone in this room is living about reproach. I think we will be a blessing to the, to the many people around us. So let's close in prayer. So for some of you, maybe you've never fully <coughs> surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never really given your heart to Him. And you've never truly asked Jesus to be the leader of your life. The one who will lead your life. So I give you this opportunity right now. And it's in through a prayer. And you simply say, Lord, I want you to lead my life. So let's pray. If that's the desire of your heart, to ask Jesus to lead your life starting today, you can pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. There are many black and whites that I know of, and I know for sure that I have gone wrong. I confess to you, I admit that I have sinned using my thoughts. I admit that I have sinned using my words. I also admit that I have sinned using my actions. But now, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all my sins. Jesus shed His blood to wash away all my sins. And now, I open the door of my heart. I ask Jesus to come into my life. I ask Jesus to lead my life beginning today. Lord Jesus, lead my life beginning today. Make me into the kind of person you want me to be. And allow me to live an ab above reproach lifestyle that attracts people to you. For some of you, today is the day you've said that prayer. Please let me know. Or please let someone know so I can pray for you. And we can pray for you. And now I pray for everyone in this room, Lord, even for myself. Lord, Father God, we pray that we will live above reproach. We declare nothing is impossible with you. Although it is difficult, we know, Lord, that through the Holy Spirit, we will live in a, a lifestyle that is above reproach. People will not question it. And if they do, the conclusion is that person is a real Christ follower, no doubt. So I pray, Lord, for the times we have compromised. <coughs> Lord, give us strength to be more strong, to be stronger in holding on to our convictions. And Lord, for some of us, maybe our conscience has been desensitized by the world. Please allow us to be sensitive now, to really discern from you what, I, what we should do, whether something is right or wrong. And Lord, we pray that our conduct will be so Christ-like that it doesn't cause people to stumble. Thank you, Lord Father God. We just want to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Continue to teach us your word so that we can be more Christ-like. To you be all the glory. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we rise up as we sing this last song? We believe about reproach. Nothing is impossible to Jesus. So everything is just possible. So why don't